Hey gang, I am Joe Edelman and welcome to The Last Frame Live, the longest running weekly photography live stream on YouTube. You know the drill, if you're watching live, please leave me a note in that chat. Let me know you're here, let me know where you're watching from. And if you're watching the replay, don't think you get off scot-free, you're part of this community. Leave a comment below the video, let me know you checked in. I always appreciate it, those of you that can't be here live, who make it a point to come back and check out the show each week. Alrighty, gosh, who do we got here? We've got uh, Joe here from California, Lynn sneaking in from New York, I got Lane in Southern Indiana, Danny in Vegas, Nikola in Udine, Italy, Calvin's here from Maine, uh, who else is sneaking in here? Chris in Toronto, the Chris Robel Experience. I like that name there. Uh, Marius from Poland. It's been a while, Marius. Good to see you. Hope all's well. Oren from Jamaica. Listen, all of you are part of a growing global community of photographers in over 100 countries who tune in to watch The Last Frame every week. And for that, I appreciate you. So this week, um, I don't have any news stories that are, shall we say, worth our time, but I do have one that I want to share in part for a chance to nerd out about some cool tech and also to many of you uh, as a reminder to get your heads out of the sand and pay attention to what's happening with technology. You don't need to do anything as a result of this story, but do be aware. So. I'm an Apple user. I work with a maxed out MacBook Pro. I have an i15 Pro, an Apple Watch, several iPads, Apple TVs, and HomePods. Now, that said, I have a lot of friends who are Windows users. And look, I'm still nice to them, but I'm an Apple guy. I just am. But that means I generally watch the Apple events that were, of course, started by Steve Jobs and now where Tim Cook comes out and announces all of the new Apple products. Well, Monday night, this past Monday night, Apple held its first evening event and it was called Scary Fast. So a little bit of Halloween in there, but it was an announcement for the new M3 silicone processors, which indeed make Apple computers blazingly fast uh, and honestly perfect for photographers and video editors. Now, if you have never watched one of these before, um, especially since the pandemic, Apple has kind of turned these uh, keynotes, as they're frequently called, uh, into really highly produced, super slick TV shows with just absolutely incredible cinematography. Now, Monday's night or Monday night's announcement was absolutely no different. It was uh, you know, brilliantly done, highly produced, except when you got to the end of the show, turns out during the credits this screen comes up. The entire show, including the drone footage that opened the show was shot on an iPhone 15 Pro Max. Now, keep in mind that the iPhone now has the ability to shoot ProRes log footage just like the more expensive television and movie cameras that were that are out there. Pretty freaking cool, right? So, think about it, like why should we even care about this? Well, two reasons in my opinion. One, it's just cool. It is. But two, you have to seriously start looking at what you spend for real cameras and what they do and how much of it you use. And you should be paying attention to this, you know, as we kind of move on down the road, right? I mean, think about it. For well over 100 years, cameras have been this standalone tool for photographers, and it's generally been something that you look through. Maybe not for that long. We'll see, right? I shared the link to the keynote uh, as well as a really cool behind the scenes video of the making of the keynote that is in the description below the video. So 
Uh, I will say some more nerding. Be sure to check out the lights that they use. Really cool stuff. All right, I do have some presentations coming up for camera clubs, but just like the last two weeks, nothing that's open to the public, so nothing for me to uh, share with you here. Uh, I will tell you, however, please remember to bookmark my education page. It's updated weekly. I will share this one in the chat so that you all have it. You have no excuse. It is, of course, in the description below the video. Um, remember, um, you can bookmark this page, check it often, but... Uh, also, I want to share a link for you to sign up for my email newsletter, right? Um, between now and the middle of November, if all goes well next week, that's, that's my target. Uh, I've got a really cool announcement for some awesome learning opportunities. Uh, subscribers to the email newsletter, they're going to folks be the folks that get the first shot at this, also with some discounted prices so links are in the chat for both the education page and the newsletter page uh, also of course they are below the video if you're coming in afterwards and don't worry I am NOT gonna spam you with a newsletter I literally at best send out one every month or so and I would never consider selling email addresses information any of that kind of stuff so no stress there okay All right, this week's featured quote is something that honestly, um, it really connects with me at the root of why I fell in love with photography. The quote, let me switch over here. Photography is a way of introducing people to other people. Uh, this quote is by photographer William Albert Allard. He's an American photographer. He was born in 1937, still alive, still going, uh, known for his documentary and his photojournalistic work. He's published a bunch of books. Uh, he worked for National Geographic for, I believe, over two decades, received all kinds of awards throughout his career, and his work focuses on capturing everyday life, and it's been exhibited in galleries around the world. I am a big fan of his work, again, because of my background in photojournalism and because I love people photography. He has a style that is not only full of bright, bold colors, but also goes to the other extreme with very subtle, very calm and mild colors that really bring the focus to his subjects. But the best part of all of it with his subjects, you learn. You, when you look at his photographs, you feel like you are learning about the people in the photographs. And if you folks have heard me tell my story in the past about how I got hooked on photography, you know, it's all about people. And for me, it was access to people. And, and it still is. Even, you know, doing mostly teaching, it's still about getting to meet people. So I've got a link to his website in the description below the video. I encourage you sincerely Spend a little bit of time there. Read more of his bio. Study his images. They are incredible. And gang, it's worth pointing out, I share these photo quotes and these photographer's links with you as kind of a guide. When you're starting your photography, you routinely hear that it's a good idea to study the work of other photographers. Yes. But no. It's got to be the right photographers. It's got to be photographers with um, something to really contribute in their body of work. And it's also on you to put a little bit of effort and intelligence behind it, right? Studying the work of other photographers doesn't just mean like doom scrolling through Instagram and waiting for something to wow you. No. Studying the work of other photographers is looking at work, and if you find it interesting... That's the starting point. Number one, if you find it interesting, well then, start to break it down. Build the context in your own mind, meaning the who, what, why, when, where, and how, right? How do they tend to shoot? 
Why do you think they tend to shoot that way? What's the benefit? Do they tend to shoot mostly wide angle portraits? Do they tend to shoot telephoto portraits? Do they do a lot of really shallow depth of field? Where do they place their lights? How do they place their lights? You can't find a better photography education than that if you're willing to put in the effort. So that's why I share the photographers that I share. They are photographers that I sincerely believe that their body of work has a lot of education built into it. So I do hope you'll check them out. And that's why I encourage you each week to go look at them, spend a little bit of time, not only read about the photographer, which often helps you understand why they have the style they have or why they shoot what they shoot, but obviously to take a good look through their images. And if you don't already follow me on Facebook, uh, Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, uh, Threads, that's the Instagram thing now, or LinkedIn, every day, Monday through Friday, I post a quote from a well-known photographer along with a link to allow you to learn more about that photographer as well as some of their work. You can also find these photo quotes every day on Instagram at instagram.com slash 80% spell out the word 80% photography okay uh, and if you're not following that and I should have had it queued up here I believe it's in the description below the video I'll make sure to add it uh, that's instagram.com slash 80% photography if you're not already following that profile you should uh, there's some really cool new content that's going to be launching uh, most likely in December um, daily content like you're seeing with the photo quotes that will be mixed in there. Um, a little bit of fun, a little bit of learning, and of course the quotes will continue. Uh, also, just as a reminder, since you're here, it would help a lot more people learn about The Last Frame. If you could do me a solid, hit that thumbs up below the video. It's not for my ego. The more thumbs up, the more people find out about the show and the more we're able to spread the word. Okay. All right. Let's see how many people Joe can piss off tonight. Here it comes. Um, our topic tonight, the pros and cons of photographic competitions. Now, full disclosure, a lot of you who follow me routinely already know this, but I'm going to ask you to hear me out and hear this through because I'm, I am going to lean on you a little bit tonight because I need to do some venting, but I'm also realizing because of this venting that I need to do that I am potentially not getting my point across as well as I need to. So I need your help on this crusade that I'm on. So full disclosure, I believe that many, keyword, many photography competitions suck, straight up. I think that they are harmful to your development as a photographer. And honestly, they can be a total waste of time unless you're a person who truly enjoys competing, in which case, good for you. I mean, there are also, again, full disclosure, there are also some excellent photography competitions that if you enter them for the right reasons, they can be tremendously rewarding. So that's my initial disclosure. There's another few disclosures coming. So here's the thing. When we talk about this idea of competition, you've talked, heard me talk about competition before in the context of as a photographer, you don't have competition unless you choose competition, right? If you're doing your own thing and you're being creative and producing unique work, you have no competition for your work. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about contests, right? So for me, I've never met a photographer, be it amateur or professional, who purchased their first camera and then fell in love with the art of photography because they wanted to participate in a photography competition. Never met that person. I have, however, met and I've spoken with thousands of photographers over the years who fell in love with photography. And then with the idea of being able to build their skills and find 
some like-minded people, they joined a camera club or a photography organization only to find themselves being bullied into participating in print or digital image competitions. Now, in addition, thanks to the internet, online photography competitions have mushroomed. I mean, it literally, forget mushrooms, they've exploded, promising all kinds of things from you know recognition, exposure, sometimes money, and of course, always accolades. Yet this competitive aspect of photography, if we can have an open mind for a minute, it raises an essential question. Is photography truly about competing? Or is it a passion that's meant to be shared and experienced collectively? Or both? Or maybe neither. But I should explain to you another full disclosure. I am on a crusade. I actually wouldn't have called it a crusade, but the president of a camera club that I judged the contest for recently is pissed off at me because, and sent me a bunch of rambling, or a rambling email with a bunch of sarcastic remarks in it because he didn't like my approach and my outlook on photography competition. So he called my work a crusade. But I gotta be honest with you, I actually like that analogy. So I'm gonna steal it because it fits. It fits within my mission of helping photographers to develop a better understanding of the hows and whys behind making consistently great photographs. So, for those of you that are here, thank you for supporting me on my crusade. And I'll gladly explain a little bit more about why this guy's pissed off later because it actually really gets to the core of what we need to work on and how I need to work on my messaging. So, let me begin with an overview of my thoughts about this pros and cons right, of competition. And then I wanna go ahead and I will share this recent experience with you um, as an example to kind of maybe how some of this stuff becomes problematic. So let's start uh, initially with the allure, if you will, of um, photography competitions, right? Now, at the outset, it's vital to understand the magnetic pull of a photography competition attracts some people, right? Because contests dangle the potential of recognition, uh, you know, a chance to shine among your peers at a camera club or to be recognized uh, in a crowded field, nationally or internationally. That's cool, we all like an ego boost. That's understandable, right? Uh, the allure of photography competitions is also validation. It's external affirmation of your skills. The idea that a judge would decide your photography merits points or a ribbon, it's enticing, right? If you get it, it's enticing. If they don't like your work, probably not so enticing. And then of course, while we're talking about the allure of photography competitions, I mentioned a moment ago, monetary rewards, right? Some online contests maybe some offline ones, but I haven't found those yet. Some online ones offer cash prizes that might, in theory, financially support a photographer's journey, right? At a minimum, maybe help buy some new gear, right? So for a lot of people, these are aspects that are understandably tantalizing. Yet, like many things that glitter, it's worth examining if they genuinely hold value. So let's talk about some of the pitfalls, common pitfalls of photography comp competitions. The first one, uh, in my opinion, creativity can find, or depending on what mood you catch me in, creativity crushed, right? Competitions come in two general formats, and this is from my experience of being in this industry for 52 years, having participated in various competitions, having judged unfortunately way too many competitions, there's basically two general formats. Those with open categories where the images are evaluated at basically face value. And depending on the judge's taste and mood that day, the image may or may not receive an award. 
Now, in these competitions, the rules are generally limited to like when was the image made, how is it formatted, how is it displayed, things like that, right? It's, it's very broad. So it is much more open to interpretation and much more welcoming of creativity, especially when we look at creativity from the standpoint of taking chances, thinking outside the box, experimenting, even potentially failing with creativity. The second category, which unfortunately is very popular among camera clubs, not all camera clubs, many camera clubs. It is a format that is outlined by an organization called the Photographic Society of America. This is their website here. You can find the link to this organization. Trust me, don't join. I'll gladly answer more questions about that if you have questions, you know, at the end, but don't join. Um, generally, the competitions that are formatted for PSA, have two categories, nature and pictorial. There are some others, they do a travel, they do a photojournalism one, but it seems that most camera clubs that I come across, they focus on that nature and that pictorial category. And along with it goes an extremely lengthy set of rules and requirements that the image have to comply with to receive points. And I'm gonna share some of those with you in a minute, right? Add to that these Contests, if you will, routinely come with um, themes or um, guidelines. Well, uh, let me call them themes, like right? that the images are supposed to uh, fit within. Uh, you know, it might be a theme like tranquility, peace, calm, contemplative, quiet. So think about that, right? How would you illustrate tranquility, peace, calm, contemplative, quiet? Now, look, in all fairness, Having themes like this, uh, albeit somewhat esoteric in my opinion, but having themes like this it can certainly, if a photographer really applies himself, really applies himself, it can push a photographer to explore unfamiliar territories, uh, new techniques. Often it can, you know, really help that photographer go someplace that they would have never considered going with their work. But at the same time, it can also crush creativity because it's going to push some photographers to create images simply that they believe the judges want to see. In other words, not images that they're passionate about, but images that they think they need to be able to get points. So in fact, PSA, this organization that I'm talking about, they provide its members and judges with a 23 page illustrated document. And I'm not exaggerating when I say 23 pages here, dang. 23 pages with illustrations and samples. This document, it details what a nature photograph is and what it isn't and how it should be evaluated. Seriously, 23 pages to tell you what is a nature photograph and what isn't a nature photograph. It's mind blowing. If you want to read it, knock yourself out. The link is in the description below the video. Um, I would like really encourage you um, take some caffeine pills or have a big cup of coffee to keep yourself awake. Um, and you know, it's the 23 pages. So even if a third of those pages are the guidelines for what makes a nature photograph, just imagine if you had to remember all of that. So like that's seven pages, just over seven pages of information when you go out to take pictures and say, hey, is this a nature photograph or is this not a nature photograph? Like what the hell does it matter? But it's a contest, right? So just saying, uh, there's more, we're far from done. Um, another problem with this contest concept, we talked about creativity can find, but also it's validation misplaced. A competition by nature is subjective. A photography competition, let's be clear. I mean, this isn't sports with a stopwatch or, or a goal line, right? So it's really, really important for all of you 
if you consider competitions in any way, shape, or form, please understand that a panel's rejection or acceptance of your photograph isn't the ultimate validation of your work and your value as a photographer. It's just not. Simple fact of the matter is, gang, and I'm going to share with you some information about some contests that I've been in over the years. Many of my images that have been published in magazines around the world would not be accepted into some of these PSA competitions and would score extremely poorly. Now, are these images I'm referring to the best, greatest images in the world? No, but you know what? I made a lot of money from those images published in magazines. Where's the disparity here, right? At the end of the day, a judge, a photography judge, we're not talking a court of law, a photography judge, is not the ultimate arbiter of the quality of your work. Primarily, and I firmly believe this from the bottom of my heart, the primary reason that they aren't is because they know very little about you. They often don't know that it's you that took the picture, even if they happen to know you socially. They know very little about you, about your experience level, or for that matter, why you made the image. But yet, they're going to judge you. So for you as a photographer, if you over-rely on this external validation, it's simply going to crush your confidence and your belief in yourself. And gosh, why wouldn't it, right? So, you know, Part of the continued problem that you have here is the competition sometimes wind up transforming the serene act because, and I, I say that kind of jokingly, but I mean it. For me, shooting, it's relaxing. Even though I tend to like, like I love doing photojournalism work where oftentimes it's very chaotic situations, but just the overall process of creating and shooting, I love it. But competitions for so many people create this high pressure race against time because you've got to meet the deadlines and your peers. And it just completely zaps the joy out of the creative process because you've got to meet all of these rules that you wouldn't normally worry about, but you have to meet them to be able to have an image that is not going to get trashed by a judge. And then even worse yet, when you do these contests, you wind up frequently with a lot of homogenization of art. Think about that word, homogenization or phrase, homogenization of art. PSA puts out a monthly magazine. Uh, I am a member of PSA. My membership's about to run out. I will not be renewing. I'll gladly explain to you why later I signed up. It was a business reason. Um, I get their magazine every month. Their magazine is full of pictures and full of articles. I'm going to tell you straight up, sometimes the, the images in the articles are not very good, but look. That's just my opinion, and that's the case anywhere. But here's what you do see every month. You see a lot of images in this magazine that are technically beautifully done, very high quality. And visually, they are stunning if you appreciate technique. But rarely do you see an image that you have not seen a million freaking times before. It's the same old stuff recycled over and over and over again because these are mostly by photographers with multiple PSA letters behind their names who go all in on these contests and they have to abide by these insane amount of rules. You know, I mentioned the 23-page document for the nature rules. So that document is for photographers and judges. Somebody sent me an article from the PSA magazine that was written by one of the more accomplished PSA photographers, a much older gentleman. And by the way, PSA is, across the board, old photographers, older than me. This gentleman had a 26-page article that defined what a nature photograph is. 26 pages to define a nature photograph. Not for judges. That was for photographers. So he took you know, what is presumably about half of that 23-page document and expanded on it to give you 26 pages to understand what is in... Who can remember that? Who can process that kind of information? I guess I'm just an idiot 
and not very intelligent because how am I ever going to take a picture if I've got to remember that 26 pages of information? Who's going to do that? That makes no sense. But yet, this is what these contests encourage. And this is what is pushed. And again, what many, not all, many camera clubs encourage and push. So for me, let's be clear. Photography, it's a passion to be shared. First and foremost. Now, you don't have to agree with me. Again, there are some photographers, in fact, I know a few, love the work, have mad respect for them, who are all in on these photography competitions. But let me be clear about something. Number one, they are working professional photographers who do incredible work. Their hobby are these contests. None of their professional work gets entered in these contests because none of their professional work would be accepted in the contest. They just happen to enjoy the challenge of can they get enough points to win little trophies? And two of them that I know very well actually travel around the world. And they've won these little trophies all around the world, various countries. That's a person who enjoys that competition. But most of you listening to this show are people who are trying to improve their photography, who are trying to learn, who are trying to get better. And that's where these competitions fail. I mean, given the potential challenges of competition, right? The concept of a passion to be shared for me, that's the core of all of this, right? Isn't that really kind of what we do with photography when we get started? It's about capturing our world through our unique lens and then sharing that vision, right? I mean, for me and for most people, historically, photography has been a medium of sharing, whether it's stories or experiences or perspectives. And then, gosh, when photographers collaborate, they can learn from each other and they can merge different styles together and different techniques and then create something novel. Every photographer's journey is deeply personal and all of you can connect with that. You know you can because just the fact of learning photography, it's, it's a process of self-exploration, discovery and growth. And it's not linear. You can't determine the value of that journey with a bunch of awards or accolades, right? At its core, photography is about the thrill of creating, waiting for that perfect light, framing the shot, capturing a fleeting moment. Sorry, but for me, that, that joy is intrinsic and it should not be overshadowed by the extrinsic awards of competition. So let's try and be open-minded here. Obviously, I have passionate thoughts about it. And I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm asking you to consider, decide for yourself. I like to think that I have intelligent followers. So... The key to all this is strike a balance, right? But, you know, does this mean we don't have to get rid of photography competitions or we shouldn't enter them or we do or, well, not necessarily, right? Like all tools, like all things in life, competitions can have their place. The key, it lies in how you approach it, period. So I like to call it purposeful participation, right? Uh, so the first thing is before you enter any competition, any photography competition, reflect a little bit on the reasons. Give it some good thought. Why are you doing it? Is it for growth? Are you hoping you will get good feedback? And honestly, don't hope for good feedback. If you're going to enter a photography comp competition, do your research. Do your research on a judge. Do your research on the competition and the format of the competition to get a sense of, are they going to score me a bunch against a bunch of ridiculous points? Or are they going to look at my image creatively and try to consider the choices that I made and give me feedback based on those choices? Think about that, right? Okay? Now, maybe you are doing like an online contest for exposure. Okay, if you feel that you might be able to do that. Fine. Or maybe you just want to win something. But be clear on the why. 
being clear on the why is going to help you navigate the process in a much more healthy way. And whatever you do, please, again, I mentioned those photographers that I know that love competitions and have done very, very well at it. And by the way, I'm talking PSA style competitions with points, with 23 pages of you know rules and guidelines and all that kind of stuff, right? Choose selectively and make sure that you're doing it because you enjoy that process. Otherwise, you're going to run the high risk, which so many camera club photographers do, of getting caught in this perpetual cycle of creating for competitions alone. So even if you're just in it for the feedback that I talked about, competitions are just one avenue for feedback, right? Peer reviews, mentorships, personalized, constructive feedback, that's where the real value is going to be. And there's one last piece to this pros and cons, and then I'll get on to the other information you wanted. One thing that photographers need to do more of, and it's very hard in today's social media world, where every day you pick up your phone and you look at a computer screen and you see thousands of images, incredible images, along with thousands of bad ones too, but lots of good ones. And we remember the good ones. You have to reward yourself. You don't need a competition to reward yourself. Celebrate all your achievements. You hear me talk all the time about the idea of, hey, you see a cool picture and you want to try that? By all means, copy the crap out of that picture. Pat yourself on the back. That's the reward. Yes. But before you share that picture, stop yourself. Don't share it. It's a Xerox. A copy is never as good as the original. Now that you've learned the technique, that's what you're patting yourself on the back for. You're going to go and you're going to take that technique and you're going to create a version. It's your own. It's all your own. Your style, your look, your feel. And then you are going to celebrate with the world and share that off. But reward yourself. Reflect on the amount of work that you put in to get to that point. Reflect on the chances that you took, the creative chances that you took, right? It's not just about wings. It, it's never just about wings. So... Another disclosure, before I go any further, uh, I should disclose, I've alluded to this, I have entered and I have won awards from several photography competitions in my 52 years as a photographer. Um, as a teenager, I won several awards, including one from Highlights Magazine for Kids. Uh, in my late teens and early 20s, I won numerous awards from NPPA, the National Press Photographers Association, PPPA, the Pennsylvania Press Photographers Association, and the Keystone Press Awards. Um, these were contests that were judged by peers, and the awards were given for excellence in photojournalism. I collected, during that time, I collected awards for uh, sports, uh, fashion, feature, and also uh, spot news images. And then fast forward to 2018, while I was an Olympus visionary, I won a People's Choice Award from Art Pop and had my image displayed on a 48-foot wide billboard for a whole year. Now, you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, he's against photography compositions, but yet he entered and he won a bunch of them. I still have not said I'm against them. I'm against the bad ones. And I'm against people being bullied in camera clubs, being bullied into having to enter them to feel that they are an important and valuable member of the camera club. So it's that differentiation between the two that I really want you to understand. These contests that I won were structured differently than the contests held by these camera clubs, these PSA competitions, right? The contests that I won had simple categories. The judges selected the images that they felt stood out and most deserved the merit. It didn't require pages of rules and guidelines to explain what a category is and how to judge it. The judges didn't have to take classes to become a judge. And that's why I entered them because they were competitions that rewarded creativity. That's the important piece. Since the beginning of this year, 2023, I served as a judge for 17 different photography competitions. 16 of them 
were creativity-based competitions. The 17th one took place this past Monday evening, and it is the catalyst for this conversation. Uh, so I want to start out, I take full responsibility for making an assumption with this contest. You see, the contest director from the camera club reached out to me back in April and asked if I could be a judge for this contest. In November, he had seen a Zoom recording of another contest that I judged here in Pennsylvania, and he commented that he really liked how I gave feedback. So in his defense, uh, in the email that he sent me, he did give me a brief explanation that his contest had two categories and there were two classes, beginner and advanced. But he didn't mention that it was a PSA con or a contest that, that followed the PSA rules, like that 23-page document that I showed you for one category. By the way, that was just one category. Um, and since he was talking about a competition that I had just judged that was creativity-based and had similar categories without all the rules, I didn't think to ask. That's on me, right? So fast forward to October, they email me in, a, a, a whole set of documents, but they sent me 80 plus photos along with a spreadsheet that contained the title of each of the photos and then three separate documents that explain how to determine if the photos fit into that category and how you should score them. And it included a one through nine scoring scale. That's when I realized this was a PSA-based competition. I have done them years in the past. I refuse to do them at this point because I feel that the format is completely toxic to the development of photographers. But it was two weeks before the event. I committed, so I decided to make the best of it. The format was that I was supposed to judge the images. This was on Monday night. I was supposed to judge the images in advance based on the scoring outline in these documents. Uh, and also they did provide links to the PSA documents like the one that I showed you. Um, and um, then on Monday evening, I would participate in what was to be a two hour Zoom meeting where they'd announce all the scores of all 80 plus photos. And then I would make a comment about each and every image along with the idea of like, why did I score it? Do the quick math, that's less than a minute and a half per photo. And that's if nothing else happens in the meeting, which of course there were announcements and things in the beginning. So needless to say, this meeting was three plus hours long because I wasn't gonna cut anybody short. People took the time to, you know, enter a photo I felt that they deserved to get constructive feedback. But of course, the problem with the feedback is I know nothing about them. I know nothing about what they went through to take the picture. I know nothing about their skill level other than a category that they're in. That's it. So yes, we went way over, et cetera. Um, the problem was, here's the funny part that you can all laugh about since you all know me and you know that I don't suffer fools very well. The very beginning of the meeting, we start the Zoom meeting and the president of the club comes in and says, I wanna thank everyone that's participated in these sessions and I'm gonna yell at everybody who doesn't. He goes on to say that we compete or we participate in the PSA competitions and I talked to a number of people this week and I heard things like, oh, I don't do the competitions. Well, we're getting, and then he goes on to say, excuse me, we're getting beat up at the national level meaning their club's not doing that well. And then he says, contact me because I know a lot of us don't like to be judged or critiqued, but we do compete naturally and we're kind of low right now. So if you have something that you would like to use, something that you've done this year, well, you can offer it up and we'll take a look at it and send it off to the PSA, which basically indicates that the powers to be at the club, if they think it's good enough, they'll send that. So, of course, he says that right after admitting that people don't like to be judged and right before I'm introduced. And then I'm supposed to do my thing. So, needless to say, you know, I spoke my piece. Um, I got a lot of tremendous support from the members of the club. I've gotten a lot of messages via email and online. Um, you know, and to be fair, the club was very thankful that I put in the time and both the president and other members have made that clear. But look, here's the thing, right? That's just me bitching. Let me 
point out to you where the real problem lied there. It was very obvious based on all the messages that I received, of which there were quite a few. Members don't really appreciate the competition. There's some. Those some should be entitled to participate. I'm not saying abolish competitions. I'm not saying, hey, you're an idiot if you want to be in competitions. No. Humans are competitive by nature. That's great. But the fact of the matter is people today don't want to compete. Most people. So when you have a camera club president bullying people because they're not participating, and even if he didn't say that, even if he didn't say it, I want to give the guy the benefit of the doubt that he didn't really mean to bully anybody, but the club's made a commitment to PSA. They're getting low scores. They need entries, right? There's the challenge. So even if we take the bullying phrase out of the conversation, this is a club where you earn your status. You are somebody in the club. If you're getting points, you're getting ribbons, you're making it into the PSA magazine. If you're not, yeah, you're just one of those people that shows up and pays their dues. And that's the problem. All the while, if you talk to any camera club, well, I shouldn't say any, that's a very broad statement. Most camera clubs, they will tell you they have a really hard time getting young members. And if they get them, they have a hard time keeping them. Gosh, I wonder why. Pay a little bit of attention to the younger generation who, by the way, I want to be really clear, I believe, firmly believe, they're the smart ones. They don't want to be judged. They're not interested in competitions. They're interested in experiences. They buy their cameras to record their lives, to record the world around them, to be able to record their experiences. They want to go out on field trips. They want to go out and see things and photograph them and experience them. And yes, they want to learn how to do it better, but they don't want to be told, you have to follow a rule of thirds. You have to do it this way. You have to do that. No, they want real practical advice. That's what they want. So why was I a jerk? I'm going to call myself a jerk. And why am I calling? I'm not going to name the club. They know who they are. I know at least some of their members are watching right now because they were warned. I'm doing it because it's an excellent example of what you have all heard me talk about. Obviously, this club didn't do the research before they asked me <laughs> to judge this competition because this is something you've heard me talk about before. But I know that a lot of you who turn in to watch this over the, next, over the course of the week, whether you're here tonight or whether you're watching it on replay, are in camera clubs. And this camera club president, he was right. I'm on a crusade. I am on a crusade to make a difference. I want to, by the time I leave this world, I want to have made a difference in this industry. So if you're in a camera club or you're thinking about joining a camera club, please consider that. I'm not saying abolish competition. I think this PSA competition is the most ridiculous thing ever. Photographic Society of America, PSA, it should stand for Photography Seniors of America. Go look at their membership. It's a very old membership. They're stuck in their ways. And look, I respect that. But God, just imagine what this org, because they've got the framework. They've got the organization built. Just imagine what they could do for the industry if they would evolve. But they refuse to. Because that would mean a lot of these old guys with white beards and lots of letters after their names and tons of ribbons would likely give up some of their status in the process. And that's unfortunate. So if you're part of a photography club, think about that. Think about that the next time you think of saying to a younger photographer, you got to learn the rules to break the rules. Biggest bunch of crap ever spouted out of anybody's mouth. Think about the fact that the next time, if you do go read those PSA rules, think about the fact that the overwhelming majority of Ansel Adams photography would not be allowed to be entered into a PSA competition because of the way their rules are structured. How does that work? Just saying. So that being said, thank you for listening. I appreciate you hearing my rant. I'm not going to lie. I am incensed when I see organizations like that that not only treat their membership that way and then they wonder why they can't grow. And it's not just this club. There are many clubs that do it. And let me be clear. 
once again, there are some great clubs out there that are getting it right and they're busting their butts to bring in younger members and really sustain. But clubs like this, unfortunately, they're going to go away. And I don't want them to go away. I want them to evolve. I want them to evolve for a younger generation, for new technology. You can't take the same crap that camera clubs were doing in 1960 and expect it to work today. You just can't. So, now, time for... My favorite part of the show. Seriously, that was a long one tonight, gang, and I really appreciate it. Had to get off that off my chest. Thank you all. I know it wasn't the most informative for you. And actually, you know what? It's not Q&A. There's a couple quick Q&A questions here, so let's do them really quick. But you know what? We're going to go over a few minutes tonight because I have a shoot breakdown for you, and I want to do that shoot breakdown. All right, so just scrolling back up here. Um, let's see. Danny, I appreciate that, that you found value, and I really do. Um, because, again, it's... All the right things in the right context, period, right? Um, Alvin mentioned here, uh, the competition is, oh, wait, wait, let me back up one. Here he is. I just did a competition uh, on in-camera motion. Uh, I kind of enjoyed doing it, but didn't win anything. And that's all right. I mean, the fact that you enjoy doing it, that's good, okay? Um, like a shout out and a critique on my image, really. That's why you win. It's a monthly competition, no cost to enter. Uh, but then he goes on to say the competition for you to get out and shoot. I would never do a PSI style competition. It sucks the fun and the creativity out. And, and unfortunately, uh, it does. Okay. Uh, Joe, when I was a kid in my early sixties, I was taking a class, a photojournalism class and my teacher entered one of my image in the Bernie Sanders contest of Bernie Sanders in a contest, which I won. Very cool, man. That's awesome. Um, let's see. Rich Cox, PSA turned me off because I couldn't enter an image that I had entered elsewhere. Yeah. I mean that too. Um, I could go on about PSA all night. I, I won't. So um, let's see. Lane, um, could some competition advance help advance creativity? Um, you know, not really, Lane. Uh, other than here, there, here's the only way that it would advance creativity. And, and you have to be honest with yourself and who you are and what motivates you. A competition is not capable of advancing anything for you other than your ego. I'm not being a jerk now. I'm, I'm keeping it real, right? I mean, if you win, yay, okay? Certainly, if you get a particularly good judge, I am very happy this club that is upset with me, or I should say their president is upset with me, the club's happy with me, and I'm happy with the, the people at the club who participated. They were very thankful, and they appreciated the amount of detail I tried to provide them. And Lane, you've heard me give image reviews before. You know how I do it. You know the depth that I go. But in terms of, Helping you with creativity, only you can help yourself with creativity. So, could the competition help you? The only way it helps you is if that's the kind of thing that it takes to motivate you to be creative. But I'm going to keep it real. If you need a phot photography competition to motivate you to be creative, you kind of got bigger problems, right? I mean, just keeping it real. So, um, again, this isn't about like, oh, competition sucks, they need to go away. No, but it is about, and that's why I appreciate your question, Lane. It is about really figuring out, is there value to you and what value you're going to get from it? And, and by the way, I made this statement early on, but I want to make sure none of you miss this one. If you're going to enter a competition, do your research. Don't just read the little marketing piece for it. I mean, if you think about it, judges judge your competition. So the first thing you should do is you should research the judges. Most competitions, they announce in advance who the judges are, right? Research the judges. Look at their work. Get a sense of what they're into and either shoot images or pick images that are going to fit with them. You know, unfortunately, and by the way, I left this out. Sorry, one more piece. This camera club I'm referring to, these 80 plus images, 40% of these images that they sent were all submitted in color spaces that weren't sRGB, meaning P3 color space, Profoto RGB, Adobe RGB, uh, one was in Epson printer RGB. Additionally, they had images that went all the way back to 2009 that people had submitted. So people were dumpster diving for files. 
they don't even know how to handle color management plus the files they give you to do the judging on were 1920 by 1080 open up a file that's 19 by 1920 by 1080 on your 4k or bigger monitor and it's like this big and you're supposed to determine the quality of the file right it, it's like ridiculous but in the case of this club their members tremendously could benefit from understanding about color management and post-processing educational things that will help them advance their photography these contests are doing are not helping them advance so you got to do your research. I mentioned my billboard picture, the, the, the picture that went on a billboard. This contest that I entered it in, it was being judged. And look, I, I had no problem you know, admitting to this. The contest was being judged by fine art people, not photographers, because it was an art competition. So photography was just one piece of it. I knew there was no way in hell I was going to win with three judges that were people that had art degrees, MFAs, that kind of stuff. But the contest had an open category that was people's choice. And for people's choice, they picked five images, they put them up online, and then people go vote. I knew that if I could have a situation like that, where I didn't have to rely on people with MFAs that were going to apply all those stodgy art rule crap mentality to my pictures, I knew that I'd stand a better chance, and I did. So research your contests, research your judges if you're going to do that, okay? Um, JDS, these competitions are annoying to me. You have to jump through their hoops, buy into their organization. Yeah, you do, unfortunately. Um, all right, one other question here, and then let me do my shoe breakdown. Cooley, how many AD200 heads do you have, and do you use the Fresnel head in a soft box? Um, I have nine of them coolly, but you don't need nine. I don't use nine. The reason I have nine is because I have a travel kit that travels with me when I teach workshops. So I just grab the case and go. It's always packed. And then I have my studio set. The studio set is five of them. So that's really the number you should latch on to, five. Okay, and then my travel kit has four in them. Um, as far as the Fresnel head in a softbox, never, 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 never. Uh, simply because the Fresnel head is not going to let the light spread fast enough to fill the whole soft box, right? So you want to use the bare bulb in, in a soft box, right? That's definitely the best way to go. Okay, uh, I think, uh, good. So I got all the questions. That's good. We didn't have any questions. Let's go ahead and do the breakdown real quick. All right, so we're gonna go over a few minutes, but I think you guys will appreciate this. And there's also, there's a link already down below the video that will help you out with this. Last week, when I was talking about AEL syndrome, always eye level, right? I showed you uh, two sample images where I talked about how this picture led me to this picture. And I just casually offhanded mentioned uh, about them being shot in shade. There are no strobes. I mean, I want you to look at the subtlety of that light and how nice that little rim light is on her face, all that. No strobes, no reflector, nothing here, right? So I do have a video. The link is in the description below the video, uh, it, below this video, excuse me. How to shoot portraits in bright sunlight. It's one of my older videos because you know I haven't done tutorials in a long time, but it's a very detailed video and it's going to cover a lot of the scenarios that I'm about to show you now. So I would encourage you to go watch it. And part of the reason why I definitely bring this up now is because we're kind of running out of time here in the U.S. Here in the East Coast, especially, it's fall. Right now, all the trees are orange, red, intense color. Gang, especially if you're in the East Coast, especially if you're in the Northeast, this is the most awesome time of the year to get outdoors and do outdoor portraits. Before it gets too cold and before we lose all the leaves. Because you just have so much color to work with. So your backgrounds are incredible right now. But the gist with these shots is super simple, right? And look, I'm not saying it's wrong to go outside and use a strobe or any kind of a modifier or other kind of stuff. But I am saying so many people do that. So many people do that. And they did the same old thing. For years, it was like, let's overpower, you know, uh, the scene by a stop or two stops and make the background a little bit darker in the foreground. And then we can shoot at high noon anywhere that we want, even if the background's crap. Well, look, I hate to tell you, number one, 
A crappy background is a crappy background. I don't care if it's properly exposed or if it's a stop underexposed or two stops underexposed. It's still a crappy background, right? Part of being a good photographer, part of making great portraits is finding great backgrounds, period. And for me, if I'm going to go outside and shoot a portrait, number one, there are always, here's my psychology, my thought process. And this is 99% of the time. If the job requires I use a strobe, well, okay, I'm getting paid. I'll suck it up and I'll go use a strobe. But otherwise, I'm not using strobes. I'll maybe use a reflector. And here's why. I know that when I go outside and I go on location, I'm going to have distractions. There could be people wandering around. There could be cars going by. There's noise. So I've got to deal with the environment. That's the first thing. Second thing, when I go outside and I'm on location, if I'm in bright sunlight, I run the risk of, and, and by the way, my eyes are very sensitive to super, super bright light. Okay? So I can work in bright light, but if I don't have to, I'd rather not. Not to mention, what if my subject is really sensitive to super bright light? Then I've got a subject that's squinting because I'm being a lazy SOB and using a 600 watt strobe, but shooting in you know the middle of a courtyard with bright sunlight because I don't feel like actually having to do my job as a photographer and find good light and find a good background. It's freaking ridiculous. I'm going to go in the shade 100% of the time. I'm going in the shade. Literally, this girl is not 10 feet from a road. My, I'm standing right at the edge of the road shooting in the shade. This is a building that I pass several times a week, especially if I'm you know, going to meet my wife it's at, at the college that she teaches at. Uh, I pass this building and every year we get you know, these vines, right? So the key to making a location like this work or shot like this work, like in this case, you've got these beautiful green vines, find a contrasting color or find a color that works with them and create a color palette with the shot. But the best part about the lighting is you can't go wrong. There's no bad light there. It's soft and it's natural. And notice you still get reality in the lighting, meaning there's still shadow underneath the chin. Not hard shadow, but it creates depth in the face. Uh, shot like this, not a single light used here. And this one looks like it's heavily backlit, but it's really not because she's basically just under one tree with a lot of green canopy up above. And there's sunlight also in front of her where I'm taking the picture as well as behind her. All natural light. Same thing. Now, for some reason, there are so many photographers that will look at this picture and say to me, but the sky's white. I'm never quite sure how to answer that because the last I checked, the sky's not blue every day. A lot of times it's white. So it's not like it looks fake. Now, maybe you prefer blue sky. Okay, that's cool. Personal choice, no sweat. But it's not that my picture looks fake because the sky's not blue. And the last I checked, there's no rule that says you have to have a blue sky, right? But indeed, if I would have taken a 600-watt second strobe outside and powered the crap out of it, I could have made that sky dark blue. So if you're one of those people that feels the sky's always got to be deep blue, well, then go ahead, right? Then take that 600 watt second strobe out and do that. But this stuff that I'm talking about, by the way, this works all times of year. This is a cloudy day. Outdoors. Wintertime. The canopy's gone. There's still orange in that on the, on the ground. So this is like late fall a year or two ago. But the canopy overhead's gone. But it's cloudy. It's overcast. And the light is just gorgeous. But here's the thing. Understand this, and I talk about it in the video, so you need to go watch the video. Your minds trick you. When I walk into these shaded areas to do these pictures, when I walk under these trees, my eyes tell me, Ooh, it's kind of dingy in here. There's not a lot of light here. And there's not a lot of light there, but there's gorgeous light there. You just have to expose for it. That's it. Even something as simple as this. Let's break all the rules. One o'clock in the afternoon, the sun is high and behind her. You can see she's backlit, right? This was a picture for a modeling portfolio. Just kind of having some fun with this. 
10 seconds later, I had her jump off that wall. No reflectors, no nothing. Look at that light. Now, I just said no reflectors, but you know I'm lying to you, right? If you pay close attention, the concrete is the reflector. There it is. This one does have a small right reflector with canopy. You'll see this in the video, right? So um, go check that out. Now's the time. This is the time of year, especially if you're in the Northeast or anywhere in the U.S. where we get kind of that fall and those fall colors. Take advantage of it, gang. If you're going to work with a model, get your model to go out so you don't have to have a coat or a jacket on because it's getting cool, right? Even if you have to go to Amazon, buy a cheap but bulky turtleneck sweater, right? Turtleneck sweaters are always cute to play with because you can also have the model hold it and play with it, right? Make sure you pick a model that doesn't have a really short neck because the turtleneck's not going to work well then, right? Um, but seriously, and use earth tone colors for the outfit. So even if you're talking with your subjects or you're going to go pick up stuff, stuff, use earth tone colors. People always ask me, what's the best color for a portrait? What's the best color for a picture? Fact of the matter is whatever color you want. There will still be some people that like it, some people that don't. There's science behind that. We can talk about that another time. But here's what I do tell them. I tell them to go with an earth tone. In other words, if they like red, by all means, wear red, but don't wear fire engine or cherry red. Wear like a burgundy or maroon. If they like green, no Kelly green, like the Philadelphia Eagles wore last week, make it forest green, like a deep green. Navy, right? No royal blue, make it navy blue. Sorry, not navy, blue. Make it no royal blue, make it like navy blue, that type of stuff. Go with natural tones, and you can go with any color that you want. So, all that being said, gang, um, thank you. Thank you for listening tonight. I feel like I kind of shorted you guys. We didn't get in as much stuff as we normally would. My apologies for that. We will uh, definitely pick up next week and get back on track with things. Uh, I will have more cool stuff for you. I do have another shop breakdown already lined up. Um, I also have a cool little toy that I'm going to share with you guys next week. Let's see if I can get it to go here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this thing is amazing. Uh, I will tell you all about that next week. I got to shoot with it today for the first time. But remember, folks, uh, one, if you haven't hit the thumbs up already, please do. Two, you got less time ahead of you than you do behind you. Don't waste it. Get out there. Use that camera. Your best shot, it's your next shot. Adios, gang. Take care.